Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to tell you a story. A story that goes back to the beginning of life on Earth. When we were first cells. And we acted chemically on the world to extract the things we needed. The nutrients to live. And we avoided the things that would hurt us. And then we grouped together and made multicellular organisms. And those organisms had the power of movement much more than the cells. Let's fast forward to the era of the lamprey. Not a very uh, attractive animal, but a vertebrate like us. Maybe the first one. It comes out of its hole in the morning, and it goes to the left, into the light, because that's where it finds food. It avoids going down and to the right, because that's where there's a toxic environment. Just like the single cells, but now with the power of prediction, it knows how to guide its own behavior. Those cells became these cells, our nervous system. We have a hundred billion of these babies inside us, each one wants to live, each one collaborates, each one produces our behavior. The slide on the right is taken from my own laboratory and it shows in brown the cocaine reacting brain circuits which can code pleasure. Touching at those arrows, cells in a brain region known as a nucleus accumbens where movement joins pleasure and causes us to act out the behaviors that we want, that our parents teach us, and also leads to drug addiction. It's this fundamental circuitry that leads to the brain in its glory, in its hundred billion cell glory, with all of these regions made up of circuits, like cities, interacting with each other across the planet. The problem with that analogy is there's 14 times more cells in your head than there are people on the planet. And each one of those cells can have thousands, tens of thousands of contacts, just like you can. So if you think of the Earth as being parallel to the brain, just working a lot more slowly, we are 14 times more complicated than, than the Earth itself. So, if you think neuroscience is not in its infancy, think again. Yet, there are some powerful principles that I think we can extract that apply to education and even to tolerance. Those principles are extracted by this machine. Now I want to take you to the last 15 years of our history on this planet, not hundreds of millions of years, where you can stick your head in that machine and it can tell you what the inside of your brain looks like. And that inside of your brain can lead to diagnosis of problems. So for example, this slide here shows a difficulty in this region here. That's not a good thing to have. And we can see this in living patients. But what really is incredible is that we can see that in an activity pattern, in a pattern of activity which shows what's happening in your brain. This is anatomy. This is what you look like even when you're dead. But we can see what's happening while you're thinking. In real time, you have to be in that machine, but we can do tests and see how you're working. Out of that has come a fundamental shift in the way we think that we think. And that is, you can find hundreds of books written by New York Times authors that explain this structure. And I want to use a prop to illustrate what this structure is. So the first part of this structure is the top of the brain, what we call the primate brain. I'm talking to you from that brain now, 
It is the most recent evolutionary step. It gives me my words and your ability to understand it. It gives you symbolic reasoning. It lets you make a representation of an idiot provost standing on a ladder trying to make a point. One step down from that, which I'll come back to, is the mammalian brain. But let me first go down to the floor and talk to you about the reflex brain. The reflex brain, or called the reptilian brain, involves a lot of structures that let you do automatic things. This is, for example, a child grasping the finger of their mother or father in infancy. And the parents that I've seen witness this wrapping of the fingers around their finger will say, the baby loves me. I, I never tell my young friends that that child with, that, with no forehead, with no brain above the eyebrows, will do that reaction. That is coming out of the reptilian brain. That kid will never know anything will never love anybody, but they do this reaction. We can set that aside and focus on the middle brain. The middle brain allows us to do things like this. This is a picture of the activity of the nucleus accumbens, the same place I showed you before. When young women are looking at pictures of attractive baby faces. This is another picture where they are looking at the opportunity to make money in what we call a neuroeconomics game in a brain scanner. That's also where cocaine acts. All these structures exist in your brain at an unconscious level. The diagram I just put up is one in which, which gives the field of neuroeconomics its life. The structures that are lit up in the functional magnetic imaging resonance scan of these people doing these tasks are in the accumbens. The accumbens is the pleasure center. It receives the pleasure circuit from the VTA, which contains the dopamine neurons on which cocaine acts. So I want to tell you a story about myself, which illustrates how this and the next circuit over, the insula cortex, works. I was in Florence. I was with my seven-year-old daughter. My wife and my older daughter were at the Uffizi. I stumbled into a leather shop. I saw a jacket. I put it on. I felt wonderful. I got a little dance. I loved the way it felt on my arm. It was an amazing emotional moment until I looked down at the price. Oh my God, I can't afford this. That's my insular cortex kicking in, telling me this is a risky behavior, but it feels so good. I got a pit in my stomach. That's the insular cortex too. And so I bought the jacket. <laughs> Maybe it's because the salesperson said to me, in a wonderful Italian accent, you look marvelous in that jacket. <laughs> Maybe that added to the feel of the leather. I bought that jacket, the pit in the stomach went away, my wife forgave me, and every time I put that jacket on, I feel like I want to dance. These processes are unknown to us. They're, they're not involved in our conscious thinking. Freud was right. But Freud got linked too much to sex. This is more like the iPad in your head. Now, how does this relate to education? Look at what you're doing right now. You're sitting here using the top of your brain to listen to me produce words. Words that if they were expressed in a foreign language, you wouldn't even hear. You'd hear it as a continuous sound stream. But you don't. You hear them as words. You operate on them automatically. You turn them into concepts. You put them down in your brain. Maybe you take a note. Maybe I'm your professor in a class, I give you a test, you spit it back to me, we call that education. That class fits into a curriculum, which leads to a major, and then you graduate. And you go out into the world, and good luck to you. 
It's the way we do it in higher education. Classroom-based instruction, facts and theories, talk to the primate brain, forget the rest of the nervous system, particularly the emotional part of the brain. There's a wonderful book called Teaching With Your Mouth Shut, which asks people in five seconds to name three most important influences in your life. Almost nobody names the classroom. Some people name teachers, but they're people who have acted like mentors to them. So what I want higher education to do is to take this great opportunity that we have to talk to each other and supplement it with work. Imagine you're in my accounting class, and we talk about the Zarbane Oxley Law all spring. Then in the summer, you go work in Deloitte Industries. Very different environment. You can't sleep. You can't talk to your friend. You can't check your cell phone. You're with adults. People call on the phone. They want to know about the Zarbane Oxley Law. You're the only one in the room. This person's a million dollar client. You answer. You do that a bunch of times. What kind of student are you when you come back in the fall and take accounting too? You're cool. You learn something in here that complements the facts and theories. The same thing happens when you go abroad. You get a language fluency. You get a cultural perspective. You grow in ways that complement, if they're done correctly, what happens in the classroom. This is experiential education. Experiential education educates the whole student, not just the primate brain. And these two brains talk to each other. And they produce maturity. And you can recognize it in the faces of the people talking about the content that is their major. And you say that student is a mature student. So this is one thing that we have. The second thing I was asked to address, which I can do really in a minute, is the issue of how we get along with each other. Now I write a blog. It's called The Other Lobe of the Brain. It's www.otherlobe.com, otherlobe.com. And it, I did a, a blog post with Laura Porter, who works for the center. And in that blog post, we wrote about the following two studies. First of all, I wrote about oxytocin. Oxytocin is this chemical that people call the cuddle drug, the love drug. You can actually buy it and squirt it in your nose, because it's just a protein. It's like rubbing a little mayonnaise in your nose, only neater. Um, and what it does is it gives you an affiliation for people that are in your in-group. And these have been done in neuroeconomics experiments where we're exchanging money. I do this, and I, I'm much more generous. So why don't we give everybody oxytocin? By the way, you know the best way to produce an oxytocin spike in someone's blood is to give them a welcome hug. I'm not kidding. Paul Zak wrote about this. You can make people have the equivalent of the nose squirt by hugging them. However, it's dangerous, because if there's an outgroup, like in an Arab-Israeli negotiation, and you think the outgroup could harm your in-group, you will punish that outgroup to defend your in-group, and more so under oxytocin. So Laura and I wrote about this piece, and then we connected it with another psychological study by Carol Dweck from Stanford. Carol wrote about an exercise that you could go through before the negotiation which convinced you that the person across the table from you had a flexibility of mind which might allow them to see your point of view, as opposed to simply reject you right away. And these, this technique produces a success in negotiation. And we think that it might produce it by causing oxytocin or affiliation-like behaviors to be generalized. If I see the world as my family, Everybody's my in-group. So my last slide is a simple illusion from the psychology department. You look at this for a second, and you see, let's say, two faces looking at each other against a white background. Then it flips, and it's a white vase against a black background. Keep looking at it. Don't look at me. Look at that. Then it flips again. Now, first of all, who is flipping this? And why can't you control it? Notice also that you can't see it both ways at once. Intellectually, you know that they're there. You know that there's the two faces and the vase. You know that they're there, but you can't see. You can only see one. That's the mammalian brain thinking for you. Hundreds, 
millions of years of evolution we've been building this. And now you're trying to explain it with cognition. Everywhere I look, whether it's higher education or negotiations between groups that fight each other, I see at least two lobes of the brain. I don't worry about the reptilian lobe because I figure people can figure out how to stand without my help. But if we don't see the mammalian brain, we miss half of the person. And maybe the half that tells you that economics or accounting is my major. Maybe the half that tells you that that person across the table is not my enemy, but we're one human family. And then the conscious you figures out how to deal with that. That's why I think experiential education, tolerance, and much of life is actually a two-lobed proposition. Thank you very much.